Hello again. We are going through a series of rebroadcasting the broadcast biography series that we videotaped in the studios of NET Television, that's a county schools channel in Bradenton, back in the early part of the last decade. And this is this would be number seven as we go through and restart them again, and I'm so glad of the opportunity to put them back on the air because we did the broadcast histories of men and women who can justifiably be called broadcast legends. Really, some of them were absolutely monumental in the history and the formation of broadcasting as we know it today. No less than our friend, who is still alive and kicking, having succeeded his legendary dad, Fulton Lewis Jr., back in the 50s, I got to the Mutual Network in 1956, and by the time I got to New York City and network radio, this gentleman, Fulton Lewis III, was also on the Mutual Network, as I said, having inherited his father's broadcast. Fulton Lewis Jr. was just, you know, a household name like Walter Winchell and others of that ilk during the early pre-war years and through the war years and beyond. And then he, uh, Fulton Lewis Jr., uh, Jr. retired, and this gentleman, our good friend, our good friend Fulton Lewis III, picked it up from there. They were both commentators, and Fulton carried the commentary on the Mutual Network well into the 60s. Maybe even beyond that, as a matter of fact, but anyway, he is now retired, living nearby here in Central Florida, and he is a consultant to businesses, and he's got a thriving workshop going on in his home with print machines and computers all over the place. So he remains very, very busy and he's providing a very valuable service, obviously, to American business from auto dealers on down to retailers all across the country. So like so many of us, he's not sitting on the porch, you know, watching the, the traffic go by. He's, he's, he's staying very, very active, which is great. He's a, a very, very outgoing and, and, and interesting man to listen to. So listen to him now. We did this back in October 2003. Here again, the broadcast biography of Fulton Lewis III. Hello, I'm Don Blair. Welcome to another edition of Broadcast Biographies. Actually, this edition is number six in the sequence in which we have done these over the last year and a half. And our special guest today is Fulton Lewis III. Now, Fulton's father, Fulton Lewis Jr., was one of a handful of nationally, if not internationally, renowned commentators of before, during, and even after World War II. So this, in essence, is a father and son show today, Fulton, and welcome to the Channel 21 studios here in Bradenton, Florida, which is where all these programs have been taped and probably will continue to be. So our topic today is the father and son lineage, if you will, the team of Fulton Lewis the Jr. and Fulton Lewis the Third. And I have a son who's Fulton Lewis the Fourth. The Fourth. And, and we're working on another Louis the Fourteenth before we're through with Is that so. right? <laughs> is Fulton Lewis the Fourth uh, in any manner, shape, or form interested in broadcasting? Not at all. <laughs> Not Not at all. So I mean, that, that part of the lineage has stopped. Okay. Well, right here at the outset, we will be showing this wonderful color picture, which you told me was actually done from a photograph. It's a chalk drawing, oh, actually, chalk. Of, okay. of a, uh, from a photograph. Great picture of your father. Yeah, my father's secretary had that done probably in the early 60s mm -hmm. and had three copies made, uh, one for him, one for, uh, one for her, and then I got one. Okay. So. Now, to set <laughs> the stage, because, you know, we, at any given moment, we have people watching this show that are saying, Fulton Lewis, who? But and others saying, oh, yes, of course. Yep. But you have to be in a certain yep. age group, and that gives you away right away. When did your father start on the Mutual Network? Actually, it was in the, the Mutual Network uh, kind of started with him. Uh, my father was a pioneer in several instances and in several aspects of that. Uh, it would have been in... 37, I believe. Mm -hmm. I was born in 36, so it would have been 37 mm -hmm. uh, when he started. 
And um, he was one of the ones that came up with the idea of co-op broadcasting. Yeah. Back in those days, if you had a sponsor, it was a national sponsor. And he kind of liked the idea of letting each individual station break away and, have, and sell it to the local Oldsmobile dealer or sell that spot. And uh, it worked. It, and, of course, that's, what, that's that was the, the way broadcasting is done. That was SOP today. when I got the Mutual that's in 65, right. sure. the yep. same year you came in. Now, your dad continued as a commentator, and a very renowned commentator, as I said, right through into the middle 60s. That's right. He, he uh, died in August of 66. Did he step down from, the, from his program because of illness, or it was just time to no, step down? No. He, actually, he, was, he broadcast up, up to the point where he couldn't broadcast anymore. Is that right? And I would substitute for him at that, at that point. Mm -hmm. But... Um, also, when he'd go on vacation, I would take over his show. Oh, yes. And, yeah. But it was in the summer of, of uh, 66 when he got ill and uh, just couldn't continue. Yeah. Because <clears throat> we later on in this program, we will show a picture of Dad in his hospital bed. Yeah. And yeah. a noticeable difference in he'd lost weight. He oh, yeah. Thin. So it wasn't a sudden heart attack. It no, was it was actually, it was, it was a pancreatic, I think there's a valve or something that uh, goes from the pancreas into your intestine, mm -hmm. and that was faulty, but they couldn't find it. I see. By the time they found it and operated, he was so weak that he really died from the surgery. Well, a little bit later on, very <laughs> shortly, we'll hear the voice of Fulton Lewis, Jr., very the, colorful. The, the way he opened every program. Oh, yeah. And when I heard oh, it, yeah. the CD that you gave us the other day, it kind of made the hair stand up. I said, oh, that's the Fulton Lewis I do remember because yeah. I'm old enough to remember him. Sure, I was a child growing up during the war, but by gosh, he was, he was there and uh, very, very prominent. Now, we want to refer to something your dad did in the mid-30s, which raised kind of a fuss. Miss Democracy. Tell I, us about that. I remember it. My father was a member of the White House Press Corps. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and every year, the White House Press Corps would have a contest. You'd draw a drawing or write a poem or whatever, uh, talent-wise. And then the Press Corps guys would get together, and they'd vote, award the prize to the winner, and the, and the winner got a case of scotch. And uh, my father wrote a song called Miss Democracy. A parody. A parody. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, he won the prize. It he was very have. funny. It was a very good song. He should have. We, but when the president's press secretary heard the song. Where, how he, did he hear it? On radio? I'm not, no, no. I think he just got a copy of the words. Okay. And I don't, I, or he may have been there at this, at, at the time when all this, the contest was going on. I see. But he was outraged yes. and sensed, and uh, he suspended my father's uh, White House press pass. And then ultimately, within a month, the word got to FDR. the president, President yeah. Roosevelt. Roosevelt saw the words, thought it was very funny, yes. and uh, restored my father's, apologized to him, restored the past. And actually, I had just been born during this period. Yeah. And I have a picture uh, of, uh, from Franklin Roosevelt, autographed to me, to saying you. from one president to another. That was February of, of there here, it is. Here it is. Here it that is. was February of uh, 36, which, yep. so I was about, 15, 20 days old. Wow. What a wonderful, wonderful memento signed by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And it, when you told me the story, it just said, you know, your father and FDR were on opposite sides of the political fence. But, but this was an era. It's, it's kind of funny because it's different now. This was an era where you and I could totally disagree, but we could have immense respect for each other Obviously, and actually like each other. Yes. Well, FDR showed... Yep. The, the kind of man he was. He could, he could take the joke, yep. laugh at himself, yep. and invite your father in to shake I, his I hand. I think political skin has gotten a lot thinner oh, over the decade. Yes. Let's, let's explore some of these lyrics for just a second. Uh, the viewer has got to, some viewers here will understand the names that we're, we're mentioning. But just so, first of all, let's pause right this second and just listen to maybe 15, 20 seconds of your father singing this song <laughs> at the piano, at a party somewhere in Washington or Maryland, that, wherever that, it was. He loved music and, and playing the piano. An and accomplished the organ musician. Was his, yep. Okay, all right, just for a few seconds, Fulton Lewis Jr. singing this song. Now the treasury is busted, and the boom has hit a low. Mr. 
your bell can't budge the budget, and it's getting pretty raw. Cause Franklin isn't playing no more, and Morgan doesn't fall. Okay, uh, we didn't want to go too long with this because the recording facility at the time, I mean, a, a microphone <laughs> on a piano, I mean, and, and what, mm -hmm. 50, 60 years ago, not too great. But this was called Miss Democracy, written in 1936. And he starts out by saying, in the days from 1919 until 33, there lived a perfect lady known as Miss, Miss Democracy. Democracy. She had a southern accent, a Tammany Irish smile. They say she was a virgin, or at least throughout a oh, wow. for a while. And then one day, a gay, and so forth and so forth. Oh, oh me, what Franklin D. has done to Miss Democracy. Now, the part we tried to play, which is not very, very clear, but they might be able to sharpen it up a little bit in the editing. He, he comes to a point where he says, one more verse. Why okay. don't you this, read that? This, read that for this me. Was the verse. <laughs> yeah. This was the verse that got him in trouble. Okay. All right. Now the Treasury is busted and the boom is had a lull. The State Department simmered down to nothing but a hall. That's Cordell, Cordell Hall, Hall, who was Secretary of yes. State. Mr. Bell can't budge the budget. Budget Director Bell. That's right. And it's getting pretty raw because Franklin isn't Frank no more and Morgan doesn't thaw. Morgan thaw, thaw Secretary of Treasury. <laughs> Mrs. Perkins isn't Perkins. Francis Perkins, Francis Secretary of Labor. Lowe. She's having labor pains. <laughs> And she sees Bill Green get greener as he tries to hold the reins. We're having a little trouble <clears throat> locating Bill Green, but that's okay. The entire situation is enough to break your heart. And here we'll exchange in, a word here. In fact, the doggone government. Yes, the bleeping government. Yes, the bleeping government's about to fall, fall apart. apart. Oh, me, what Franklin D. has done to Miss Democracy. Fabulous, fabulous. Uh, that was heard by the White House press secretary, who obviously did have a thin skin <laughs> and not a great sense of humor. I don't think so. And then and, your, uh, your father. But the president did, and yes. that was kind of neat. Isn't that really that was kind fabulous? Of neat. Yeah. Now something. And believe me, I treasure that picture. I'm sure you yeah. do. I certainly would. Oh man! And also a little bit later, a picture of the one of the men mentioned in that song. Yeah. To you. Yep. Which I would, I would frame and, and never let out of my sight. Now, uh, look at this. Your father, you said, was an accomplished musician. Virginia's Cavalier song. Words by Lawrence Haywood Lee, Jr. Music by that's Fulton right. Lewis, Jr. 1925. That song was probably written in about 22 or 23 when he was either a, a sophomore or junior and at the University the of Virginia. School. I went to the same school, and if you go to a football game at UVA now, they play that song. Isn't that, uh, great? that is the, the marching song of the University of Virginia. All right. For, if, if there's any UVA fans out there or, or, you know, alumni, come and sing dear old Virginia's name and make the Blue Ridge roar for the world yields, yields honor to her name, who knew her deeds of yore, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's a, not an untypical, you it's remember a typical remember the song, Mr. Song. Touchdown USA? USA, yes. It was kind of a plagiarism on this. The, the, the melody yeah. is pretty, pretty, not legally close enough to be a plagiarism, but it's pretty close. Here's another nice, <clears throat> nice uh, piece of memorabilia. Uh, certainly a treasure. This is our First Lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, yep. who may have been the strongest First Lady we ever had. Could well be. Yes, it could well be. Because others have been demure, behind yep. the scenes, charming, entertain ladies groups, etc. Not that Jackie Kennedy was a, you know, a, a, a wallflower by no means. I mean, she traveled the world on behalf of her husband. But I think this woman probably more than anyone else that ever I think she set, a, she set a pattern because if you look at first ladies after that, they have all had some cause. You know, I think of Nancy Reagan's Just Say No. Yeah. Uh, but nobody was quite the crusader that Eleanor Roosevelt was. Lady that, Bird was out planting <clears throat> bushes. <laughs> oh, I've got to remember that. Yes, I do Plant remember a bush that. or a shrub or yeah. a tree. Remember yeah. that? But also. She was what I would call an activist. Oh, and very. Were, and very political. There are people, there are yeah. lots of people that. Didn't like Eleanor Roosevelt. Well, look at very much. Eleanor Roosevelt at the, at the United Nations. I mean, you know, you, you didn't that have to ask. That was her child. Where, that you, was her child. You didn't have to ask where she stood on anything. That's right. She would tell yeah. you, and I'm sure Franklin D. heard a few things too. But there, you know? there are very few. If you go through the years here, there are very few first ladies that have, that people have taken pot shots at. I mean, political mm -hmm. pot shots mm -hmm. at. 
they took a lot at her because she invited it. She yeah. was standing right out there on a political platform. Well, it was, it was in an era when they still said, and did for decades to come, that the vice presidency was a case of a disappearing act. Because right. when you became yeah. second on the ticket, that was the last you were ever heard yeah. from. Until yeah. a, few, a few presidencies ago, you started to get an assertive person, like an Al Gore or somebody like that. But uh, well, he had Harry Truman, of course. But yeah. Harry Truman, when he was vice president, was way behind the scenes. Nothing. Nobody, you know, he had been a senator from Missouri, but when he walked into the then. White House, his fa your fa uh, <laughs> your father, FDR, had never even briefed him on a thing called the atomic bomb. That's right. So, oh, what's yeah. this going on? That's right. And then he had to make a pretty bad, you know, big decision we, in a very we, short time. As a country, we've learned a lot. I you guess know, we so. have transition committees and things like that. Yeah. Now. Uh, we're going to bring in, uh, uh, probably get a quick shot on camera here, but we'll do it uh, later on when we put the whole program together more tightly. A wonderful color shot in our background here of your dad as a Calvert man of distinction. Uh, were you old enough to remember when this situation came I about? I do. The, I remember when the photographers came down. We had a home in southern Maryland uh, called Placid Harbor, which was in Hollywood, Maryland. It was just north of the uh, Patuxent Naval Air Station, and it was uh, on a little creek that came off of the, the uh, Patuxent River. And their photographers came down. Calvert, of course, was a lick, liquor, mm -hmm. and uh, they named him their Man of the Year, Man of Distinction. And they were down photographing for weeks and weeks and weeks, but uh, not for days and days. Yeah. But that was that picture was done on our back porch, which overlooked the creek, Cuckold Creek, which opened up into the uh, into the river. That's where I grew up. That's beautiful, a, beautiful. Yeah, place. some wonderful mementos, and uh, as well I've you should. I got this little thing down here, which nobody will be able to oh, see. Oh yeah, the whole, it's taken by home. a friend of mine, and it that home is now a yacht club, and a union owns this. Um, and and that's their office bed. They bring people down there and this they relax on the, and on the Patuxent, Patuxent River. River. Yep. Okay, yep. love that shot. And of course, at the time, that was an honor only accorded to Americans of, of great promise. Oh yeah, oh, you yeah. you didn't become a Calvert Man of Distinction uh, working in a local you know barber shop. His I mean, church wasn't really excited about it. <laughs> oh, I know. They I know. didn't think this was the greatest thing in the world. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, Isn't that funny that we should even be saying that, it, that, that there was even a slight controversy with what we're looking at today, every day, in public life? I'll tell you, Don, there was, there was a funny story. This was down in Hollywood, Maryland, and this was kind of a depressed area. It was uh, tobacco farms uh, and a lot of prostitution, alcohol, and gambling because of the naval base there. And uh, he built... He built a pipe organ. We were Episcopalians, but there wasn't an Episcopal. Your father built a pipe organ. He, he and the choir kids, he, he took over the choir at this little Hollywood Methodist church. It's still there. And uh, the, the kids took, the kids were pretty good. It was a good children's choir. He would take them on concerts, and all of a sudden they would hear pipe organs. Well, they had a piano at the Hollywood Methodist church. So I remember they came over in a, in a little delegation one day and said, Mr. Lewis, we'd like to get a pipe organ. And he said, of course you would. Do you have any idea of what it would cost to get a pipe organ? Yeah. And um, he said, there's no way on earth we're going to get a pipe organ. That night, he got a book and uh, started reading it on how to build pipe organs. And within about two months, he had some of the kids. He taught them how to be carpenters and how to do this, this kind of work. Two of them, in fact, now are professional woodworkers and have very good businesses in Southern Maryland. But they built a pipe organ. And then he would go around on the lecture circuit because the, the part of a pipe organ you don't build are the pipes. Yes. You know, they're metal pipes sure. and, and so you go around and you buy those. He would go on a lecture tour and instead of asking for a, an honorarium, the honorarium would be a rank of pipes. Give me a few pipes. <clears throat> one, of the, one of the lectures was at a, an, a national meeting of Seagram's so hey, he was out of this liquor thing, wasn't right? He? Yeah, <laughs> Seagram's now donates a rank of pipes to the Hollywood Methodist oh, Church. Oh boy! And this got all the way up to the bishop <laughs> as to whether they could accept it from yeah, uh, Seagram's, yeah. and they finally did. And at the Hollywood Methodist Church, there's still that little plaque on there, donated by Seagram's. Wow! So anyway, that's your man of distinction. A nice picture. Uh, in 1963. 
it marked your dad's 25th anniversary, if not maybe with Mutual or just in broadcasting? I think, in, I think with Mutual. With um, Mutual. Well, here's the, here's the program honoring Fulton Lewis Jr. for his 25th year in broadcasting, and it's at the Statler Hilton in yeah. Washington. Yeah. And the Toastmaster, mm -hmm. this is a picture, this is the first picture we see of you in your youth, Fulton. That's you're, right. You're in the right foreground in this shot, but the man you are speaking to would soon become Senator George Murphy Fam from famous California. Famous actor, George yep. Murphy. Yep, song and dance man, yep. a Ronald Reagan friend. Oh, yes. And uh, the two of you in conversation. And that is, as I said, the first time we, we see Fulton the Third in there. But uh, Toastmaster was George Murphy, a name that some of our viewers may associate with, Ray Henley. Oh, sure. The editor-in-chief of Three Star Extra. Was yes, that Sunoco? I think it was, yeah. I think Sun so. Oil Company was yeah. sponsoring that. Bob Hurley, who was my, your boss and my former boss yep. at the Mutual Network. Yep. Uh, Senator Bricker from Ohio, yep. prominent in that day, and now Fulton Lewis Jr., et cetera, et cetera. It, well, was, it, was, it was neat growing up in that atmosphere. We had a home in Washington, and then we had a home, the, the Placid Harbor down mm -hmm, in, uh, mm -hmm. on the Patuxent. But I, as a little kid, I would stumble over vice presidents and senators and in your uh, home, in my home, and it was, you know, you kind of took all this for granted. Uh, you know, you weren't starstruck. Now, when I went out to California and I would meet a movie star, I'd I'd, I'd just go goo goo in my, and it's the same way with them. They come to Washington, they fall over movie stars out there. Yes. They come to Washington and get a chance to meet a senator, and chills go down their back. So. Sure. I, I guess it's the grass is always greener in the other fellow's garden or what? Of course, at the time, uh, when, when FDR died, uh, there was kind of a furor, like all, all of a sudden this little haberdasher from, you know, from Missouri Very is going to be our leader. Sure. I mean, heaven help us. And he, and hadn't, he hadn't done well as a haberdasher. He, he <laughs> went bankrupt. Right. That's right. But he sure, showed, he sure showed a certain amount of metal. When I was this high, um, Sam Rayburn, mm -hmm. the House Speaker, mm -hmm. was over at the House for dinner. And apparently, I don't remember this, but apparently, you know, he had a big 10-gallon hat that oh, yes. was his, oh, yes. should have been tattooed on him, but it yeah. was inseparable. Right. And apparently, while they were in having dinner, I took the hat and put it upstairs <laughs> underneath my bed. And then it was getting late. I went to bed. I, now, I don't remember this, but that was, that was the story. And, oh, did I ever get in trouble. It took about three days for them to find this thing. It's a wonder they didn't bring up an, a motion of censure of Probably. you they on, on, the, on the Senate <laughs> they floor. Should've. But here again, I mean, here was, here, my father was a conservative Republican. Here was Sam Rayburn, who was a, a Democrat. Sure. And the, the political labels didn't mean as much mm. then as they mean now. Interesting, yeah. Well, we've, we've seen that with, with your dad and FDR meeting personally and yeah. the, front, the president yeah. apologizing to your father, which I think is and that, wonderful. That was one of the neat things about America. I, th I, oh, I remember boy. when I was in broadcasting, sitting up in the radio gallery in, in, uh, in the Senate watching a very heated debate, and Barry Goldwater was over here, Hubert Humphrey was over here, and they were calling each other everything within the rules you know, the gentleman from Minnesota, the gentleman from oh, Arizona. Yes. And they still could, do that. Oh, yeah. And you would think that those men absolutely detested each other. That night, I went to the Colony Restaurant in Washington, and there they were having dinner and just the best of friends. And yes. no man cried harder than Barry Goldwater did when Hubert Humphrey died. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And, and unfortunately, I think we're, we're losing that in this country. Maybe, maybe. Occasionally you do see a coming together where you see a Senate Democratic leader and a Senate minority leader, you know, kind of in the same group, and they're slapping each other on the back. And Well, you may have a point. Is it all just a facade? Is it all just a big act? Remember when, when Senator Bradley, the basketball player, sure, retired Bradley. and yeah. kind of retired in protest? Mm -hmm. His thinking is the my, system. same thing, yeah. That, yeah. It, that this is wrong. If, if I'm a Republican... And if I say today is Tuesday, and if you're a Democrat, you've got to say it's Wednesday, mm -hmm. and vice versa. You know, there's, there's nobody right, nobody wrong here. Well, we're coming to a point now where in 1963, that's what we've gotten up to. All right. Uh, we know that, uh, first of all, uh, I guess that was the year 
No, yes, it was the year they honored your dad on mm -hmm. this 25th anniversary, and only months later, we had a president assassinated. Mm -hmm. All right, let's pause here and listen to, and this is going to be the clearest, and we'll run it for a, a minute or two. I want the, the viewers to hear the voice of your father in his prime the way millions did every night on the Mutual Network. He was very upset This about is that. a special tribute, a special broadcast, mm -hmm. just days after the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Let's listen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Fulton Lewis, Jr., speaking from the Washington studios and uh, from the Mutual studios in Washington, D.C. It has been a sad, emotionally debilitating, a tragic weekend here in Washington, and one, the one that has just passed, partisan political or philosophical sympathies have been cast aside, and properly so, in a universal feeling of shock and sorrow that in this modern day and age, when we like to think of our nation as a, the leader of the free world, that such a thing as the assassination of the President of the United States could happen. But it did happen last Friday in Dallas, and the events that have tumbled over themselves in endless succession ever since have made the emotional pain the more painful and deep and have left a nation and a world in a state of near coma wondering what uh, wondering that it can all be true that the john f kennedy who last friday morning was a vibrant vigorous fighting protagonist of the things he had decided he should stand for and were right for the country is now dead his mantle left to a new president of entirely different personality and demeanor perhaps of different philosophies and policies and approaches. It is difficult and totally redundant for me here tonight at the end of the tragedy and its many ramifications and the details of what followed to give you any story of what has happened since last Friday night's broadcast. Most of America and much of the world for that matter has been glued to radio and television for the running report of what has happened the recoil of first shock that was felt around the world, the reactions of the various nations to the assassination, the return of the presidential remains to Washington after swearing in of the new president aboard the plane in Dallas, the president's body lying in state in the East Room of the White House to receive the respects of members of the family and national dignitaries, the solemn procession from there to the Capitol building, where it lay in state for the general public from yesterday afternoon until its departure on the final journey this afternoon. The hundreds of thousands of people of all faiths and creeds and races filing past and finally the fu funeral services shortly after noon today at St. Matthew's Cathedral and the burial rites on the grassy knoll in Arlington National Cemetery in front of the Lee Mansion overlooking the Lincoln Memorial, the Washington Monument, and the capital in the distance. There were poignant side incidents, many of them, that tore unwilling tears from the most stoic of watchers and listeners. For one thing, the stalwartness and determination of Mrs. Kennedy, who went through it all like the gallant soldier she is. Okay, right up to the point where your former colleague and mine, Steve McCormick, I guess you could say our boss, is our boss, yeah mentioned that internment would be private. And the program goes on and on and on with tributes from Drew Pearson, probably the, what would you say, the headline commentator of his day, with the possible exception of Walter Winchell. I mean, there were two or three superstars that, that were always in that pantheon in those days. Yep. Gabriel yep. Heater, oh, there's good news good tonight, news today. all that kind yeah. of stuff, you know. But your dad was right there amongst that fraternity, and I just wanted to show a, a series of pictures. Drew Pearson was a columnist, m uh, more than a broadcaster. More Drew Pearson a bro had, a, had a broadcast for a while, but his, mm -hmm. his real claim to fame was, uh, was as a columnist. Yeah. He, he and my father, when I was born, were very, very good friends. Mm -hmm. They both worked for the Old Times Herald. Yeah. Uh, neither one of them talked politics. I was born. And now my father turns to Drew Pearson and asks him to be my godfather. Uh -huh. And years later, when they got into politics, now this kind of belies what I was saying earlier about how you can be politically opposed yeah, yeah. and yet good friends. I don't know how many lawsuits they exchanged. They, really? uh, oh, oh, they were at each other's throat. They never said anything nice. What, libel? 
oh, yeah, and, yeah, mostly libel suits. And neither one of them collected, the lawyers got rich, but neither one of them <laughs> yeah. collected a penny. But the lawsuits went nowhere. Yeah, right. I, I remember when I was in, uh, in Chicago for the 64, it must have been the 60, I, it, was, it was a convention when my father was still alive, and I do remember we were at the pump room in Chicago. And I looked across the room. My father had never told me this, but Drew Pearson was my godfather. Oh. I look across the room, and there's Drew Pearson. I said, Dad, there's Drew Pearson. And now he tells me the story. And I said, I think I'll go over and introduce myself. Uh -oh. So I did. And Drew Pearson's hands were shaking when he heard the name. Oh, boy. But now, a month later, uh, no, it must have been six months later, because my birthday is in January, and the convention must have been in the summer. A, a car comes up to, up to our home. There is a chauffeur that gets out, comes up, rings the doorbell, gives a package to my mother, and says, this is a gift for Fulton Lewis III from Mr. Pearson. And I swear this is true. My mother takes the, the gift, puts it up to her ear. It's ticking. Uh-oh. It was a watch. <laughs> She put it out on the back porch for about a month. She didn't put it in the pail of water. She, no. <laughs> and finally, she went out there courageously one day and opened this thing, and it was a very nice watch. Oh, okay. but you don't still have that watch, do you? I have the. Well, I don't have it on, but no. I have the watch. You do have it. Yeah. Okay. Some other pictures. This is a wonderful picture. Uh, you described this, and I can understand why. The one that Mutual probably used more for PR than anything else, because yeah. it just looks sensational. It looks great. Yep. It looks healthy. It doesn't have the uh, mutual logo well, that, that on the That would have been uh, in the, probably in the 50s that okay. that was taken. What's this, any significance here to Dad with a little model cannon? Or probably something he built. I, I, actually, this was another publicity yeah. uh, picture, but I think he had woodworking and music were yeah. his two big hobbies. Okay, when we get and into your youth, we'll see that. This is the picture I referred to earlier of Fulton Lewis, Jr. in a hospital bed um, with a very lovely blonde nurse. But uh, compared to the other pictures we just saw of your father, you can see how drawn yeah. he has become and yeah. how, how, how thin he had become. Yeah, that actually was weeks before, uh, before he died. Oh. And I tell you, the, 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 the hospital staff was as broken up as the family. Oh, he, yes. had a, he had a neat personality, and he was always good-humored mm -hmm. and uh, had a way of just making friends. Mm -hmm. Well, just before we, and we're moving into the Fulton Lewis, the, th uh, the third, I remember him. Yes, uh, that era in the last half of this uh, program. But uh, were th was there conversation that more or less uh, uh, initiated you into the, into, the f into the world that you followed him on? I mean, did, did, he, did you listen to his comments, or didn't he politicize that much around the house? Because you had to step in, in pretty famous shoes. Did you mirror his philosophy, or was it all your feelings not influenced by what you had heard your father say for years? It, Don, it's hard to say. I, you know, I, I hear his broadcast. I didn't listen to him every night. Mm -hmm. My mother did. <laughs> but, um, you know, obviously I heard the politics. I was involved in the politics around the House in the late 40s. Mm -hmm. um, they would bring senators down from Washington, and, and Placid Harbor was a neat place for them to recuperate and yeah. recharge their batteries mm -hmm. to go back into battle on Monday. And I was, I was a party to that, more like a, a Senate page would be. Somebody would want a cigar, somebody would want a book, somebody would want a <laughs> glass of water or Coke or whatever. So you were a gopher. And I was a gopher. <laughs> and so I'm sure some of that sunk in, but I, I, I kind of created, I guess, um, and, and I very much agree with his, uh, his politics, but I, I have a feeling that I got there on my own okay. with his help. All right. So it, it, I, I still to this day, and I know people on the other side of the political fence are going to disagree with this, but I just feel that what we call the conservative philosophy is so darn logical that it's hard to disagree with it. Okay. But I've right. spent that's, a lot of that's years. Another, that's another two-hour program. Yes, that's right. <laughs> but back in the early 60s, right. I, I had... When I got out of college, I played the piano in a bar in New York for two years and came this close to getting disowned for doing it. Oh, wow. But uh, it was a good experience for me. I got out of that, got into radio in western New York, and then I ended up as staff director of the Internal Security Committee, House of Representatives. Then I evolved from that into 
going around the country doing a lot of lecturing. I, I spoke on uh, and debated generally on, uh, it was 870 college campuses in a wow. period of two years. Was very active in the Young Republicans, very active in Young Americans for Freedom, which basically was Barry Goldwater's yeah. and Bill Buckley's youth organization. Well, I'm glad you put it, you, you framed it that way. But lest anyone be watching us and thinking that Fulton Lewis III kind of fell into the job when his dad gave it up. I mean, you, I, you certainly I was, had a... I was pretty active. In 64, wow. now he died in 66, yeah. I was one of Barry Goldwater's speechwriters. Yes. And uh, We have a picture of... I, I was thing. assigned to the uh, Bill Miller his vice presidential. Yes. That's a good trivia question. Who yes. is Goldwater's running yes, yes, yes. But I was really assigned to the Miller campaign. But uh, no, I, I was, I had already kind of arrived at my own political beliefs. I want to show on it. This is a step back because now we're already up into your active life. But <laughs> I want to, we, just a nice series of pictures here we want to show. Father and son. When we talk about the musical connection, there is your father at the uh, piano and there is you a little toehead, looking very, very no teeth, as I devotedly recall. at whatever Dad has to say. And then you talked about the wood shop. This is in Maryland, you told me. That was down in Southern Maryland. That Southern was in Placid Harbor. That and was the same shop where he made this pipe organ. Oh, yeah. But He's that was in the basement of Placid Harbor. Placid okay. Harbor was an right. enormous home. And then we move up a few years. and uh, Good looking. In Good our, looking. In some of our local <laughs> papers, we have a, a, a weekly feature called The Missing Teeth Club. That's, that's and kids that have lost their their you know their first first generation teeth. And here's Fulton Lewis I should the third, be an honorary member of that with a couple. Isn't he? Isn't he a handsome little dude? <laughs> yeah. And and this is I love this. I mean, father playing with trains, and the son. I mean, of course, dad is doing. It looks like he's got a soldering iron there. Maybe he's welding a little connection to the transformer and stuff like that. Now but, I inherited. Uh, I trains inherited, have made a comeback. I inherited that from him because I bought. In the 60s, I bought a set of trains for my son mm -hmm. that I've never let him touch. <laughs> oh, gee. Those are his trains, but don't you dare touch them. It oh, was the same thing here. They must be worth a fortune, if they, you know, especially if they're still in the original cartons they, they or something. Were, I bought them in Germany. They this were. is the family. Fulton, the dad, <laughs> is up there in the center. Uh, Fulton Lewis III's mother is in the front foreground. Your sister is on the left. My sister, Betsy. Betsy and Fulton the third on the right. Yeah. Lovely, lovely picture. And this again, uh, uh, this is kind of a, a forwarding of the musical transfer, father and son at the organ. That's not, is that, that the organ he built? That was the organ he built and that was, actually this was, he built three organs. This was in our living room. He mm -hmm. built one at Placid Harbor. There was a, an organ at Placid Harbor. He built one for the Hollywood Methodist Church and then later he built another one for St. David's Episcopal Church in Washington. Mm -hmm. But that was in our living room, and it, there was a full pipe organ in the house. Very nice. Now, we're back up to Fulton Lewis, the young man, really, really cutting his teeth in the field, in the business, uh, getting out with not, not just celebrities, but politicos and everything else. Now, tell me the circumstance of this, and if there's anybody in our viewing audience that doesn't know who we're looking at. <laughs> I, I have always idolized the music of Louis Armstrong. Oh, I think that Louis yes. Armstrong, born July 4th of 1900, wow. I think he's wow. a, a real American icon. Yeah. And he was performing in New York. I happened to be up there. You were and in college at the time? I, no, I, this was post-college. I was playing the piano at a bar in New York. Oh, okay. So I heard that he was down somewhere, I think, in the village. And no, I, it was up in Harlem. Mm -hmm. And I took the night off and I went up and listened to him and uh, had the chance to chat with him afterwards and had this picture taken. And it says, What a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful person. It says to Buddy, and that is your nickname. That was my nickname. Best wishes, Louis Armstrong. Now here comes a picture which uh, I wrote in my notes here for this program, <laughs> brought out in me insane jealousy, I have to tell I, you. Anybody that could spend a little time with the young beautiful Elizabeth Taylor. Tell me the circumstances this of this before, picture. This was a little bit before the other picture. This would have been in okay. about uh, 56. I was at the University of Virginia. Virginia. George Stevens was filming The Giant, the wow. movie The Giant, down mm -hmm. in Charlottesville. Yeah. And uh, they had a rule that no students are going to come anywhere on near the set and this mm -hmm. and that. And there was a lot of controversy about it. And I said, ah, that you know, nobody's asked the right way. So I called tried to get to Elizabeth Taylor. I knew, we knew where she was staying. Mm -hmm. And I called her publicity manager and I said, 
I would like to write an article, and I think it's going to do you some good because you've got some bad will around here right now. Uh -huh. I'd like to come out and just do an article on Miss Taylor and her, her thoughts about Charlottesville and so forth. Mm -hmm. He said, I think that's a great idea. So that was the, that was the, uh, the beating mm -hmm. and photographers and all this. You are the gentleman standing right smack I dab am, in the center yes, of the picture. Yes, that's right. And she is the lady see, seated. Mm, yes. <laughs> and I, I'll tell you what. I gathered that. She was absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, she's stunning. Yeah. And yeah. the next day, oddly enough, it was kind of overcast and they were not shooting. And now the publicity director calls me and says that Miss Taylor has always wanted to see Monticello, She's always wanted to see the university campus and, uh, or grounds, as we called it. And uh, so I spent the day escorting, showing her on the 25-cent tour. And I tell you what, if you <laughs> remember the old saying, big man on campus? Yes. I was a giant. Oh, I was a brother. giant. Oh, wow. Well, I, now, I, now I'm even more insanely jealous. I'll you tell spent, you what. spent the day with Liz. Yeah, I... I uh, uh, that relationship went nowhere. <laughs> really? Nothing happened? <laughs> Nothing happened. Well, Nothing happened, unfortunately. Well, she, had, she married six Beautiful times. Woman. I, guess, I guess she figured, you know, that's, that's, uh, she had something going. I think going. one or two of them twice, didn't she? Yeah, Richard? Yeah. Now, here's another nice shot taken on the Capitol steps in Washington. Fulton Lewis III is at the extreme left in the, uh, looks like a white suit, but it's certainly a light suit. Actually, it was a suit. light tan light corduroy tan. suit. Okay. Now, over to the right, our viewers will pick out a very young, well, you were both very youthful, Senator Ted Kennedy. And I assume he was senator then? He was a senator, yeah. And there's a whole bunch of either Japanese or Chinese, Chinese, Chinese what, soccer? Yeah, th this, was, uh, this was in the 70s, actually. And uh, this was right after the ping pong diplomacy started mm -hmm. with China. And I was director as kind of a hobby. I was uh, one of the people in charge of the youth soccer in Fairfax County, Virginia. I, all my kids played soccer, and I got involved in this thing up to my head. I'd played soccer in college. And somehow, and I don't remember quite how this happened, somebody convinced me to not only get involved with, but to put up the money for and to sponsor a game at RFK Stadium between the United States Olympic uh, or the national soccer team yes. and the Chinese soccer team. Mm -hmm. And I did it, lost my shirt on it, but it was a, I think it was an excellent cause. Kind of a breakthrough, and wasn't it? It was. Yeah. It really was. Yeah. And, and, and nicely, the game ended in a tie. Oh. And they did not go, normally they would break a tie in yeah. a soccer game with penalty kicks, but we decided well, not to. Great, great, great shot. But, but this again, this, this was, there are Republicans in that picture, there's Teddy Kennedy, there was a nice melding of... Yes both sides and of the you political were in your fence. full blown in your radio days then that's right uh, you yeah. were very active uh, yeah. on the mutual network yep yeah. as was i here is another absolutely priceless memento of yours that i want to show again this is a step back but i don't i have do you have any idea what year this this may have happened you had to be it, a very young man oh i would have had to have been two three years old but that would have been in the 30s yes and wow. uh that was cordell hall who was secretary of state very famous secretary yes of state. very austere is the yeah. way i always thought of him yeah very cool now reserved I, you know i never uh, two or three i don't have right. that kind of memory the of fulton it. lewis the third with all good wishes cordell yeah. hall yeah, yeah. A famous figure in world history because he was, I think, about ready to engage the Japanese ambassadors in a in a kind of a last ditch discussion to try when to he, avoid when he was handed a note saying, "Guess what? Right. They just they just put right. Pearl Harbor at the bottom." Boy, I remember that day. We were down at Placid Harbor, mm -hmm. and um, my father got the news that Pearl Harbor had been attacked. We had a an old Ford station wagon, was new Ford station wagon, <laughs> but we drove faster than I'd ever been from Placid Harbor, the 40 miles up to Washington. And um, I, uh, I, I vividly remember, I, w I was only, uh, what, five years old, but mm -hmm. I vividly remember that, and I remember the war. Now, I don't remember, uh, recall you bringing in a book of scripts of your father's shows. I, 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 I when, when he... No, did, did you bring him in today? Right here. Oh, right here. Yeah, I've got, okay. that's just one of... Well, I've before we run out of time, I want to defer right this second. Okay. T do you have it marked, the, the one on I, Truman? I just was browsing through this. Would you please go to the Truman? This was 19... 
40, 1949. Okay. These are all and shows from 49. The, the, this is a book. These are the original scripts, and, and you can see where he changed his mind and scratched this out of and so forth. And not the computer that we can clean up today right. so easily. Today, was, that was the old-fashioned carbon paper and cross it out and everything else. But this he, is about Truman and, and the White House. Truman... Truman had first of all he had built that uh, platform of portico, the portico the in the in the front of in the back of the White House, yeah. which was some people thought a white elephant, but well, they, they did they, they thought it was blasphemy. Then then he decided that they needed to redo the interior of the White House, not okay. the wings, but all just right. the center of the White House. Now obviously your father didn't agree with all of this, and he I would like you to, I would like you to read a portion right. of it, would you? The price tag on this thing was going to be $8 million. Okay. He says, what sort of a home is an $8 million home? The most prolific and, and magnificent palaces in Hollywood, California, never cost over a quarter of a million. I remember this 1949. That's, that's yes, way back. And you may be abundantly sure that the remodeled White House is not going to be on any scale that surpasses those. Just how could you spend $8 million on a home for anybody? Yeah. You know what a $50,000 home is. Of course, then $50,000 home was beautiful. Boy, a heck of a It home. should be very, very beautiful. You can imagine what you could do in the way of a home, for example, for $80,000. Wow. Well, this little remodeling job, which the government is going to do at your expense, is not going to cost $80,000, but 8,000 times $80,000. <laughs> and even that may not be enough. That, okay. That's a pretty typical example of the sort of thing that my father would get involved in, mm -hmm. and and it was all kind of, let's you know, let's try to put a cap on some ridiculous spending. If it had happened in your time, when you took over Dad's show and continued it on into the '60s, when when I wandered into New York and started working for the same network, uh, do you think you would have taken the same tack? Would you have gone after the man uh, for not exorbitant for, expense? Not for eight million dollars. Eight well, million dollars everything would have been, been in, Everything would have been. In its category. If it had been deemed, I mean, if, if it had been a total outrage, mm -hmm. and, and apparently in this day and age, what he was doing was a financial oh, outrage. Oh, I, I, I remember. I would definitely would have done it. I was just kidding. One of the things stuff. I regret about, about leaving broadcasting when I did was I kind of would have liked to have been around during the Clinton years. Because I would have had, oh, I would have had a lot of fun with that. I bet you would. A lot of fun. I bet you would have had a lot of fun. But it's I, no fun to be a commentator when a man you agree with is in office. It really isn't fun. I can imagine that. Because it's, you don't want to go on and just drool over everything that the president is True. doing and be in a, in a defensive stance. You don't want to be a Rush Limbaugh, in other That's words. That's right. Yes. You, you, want, you want to, it's a lot more fun to have somebody in there that you could criticize. Give me a comment here. You got a letter from Richard M. Nixon in 1967, and he's saying uh, uh, to uh, Vietnam and the account of your own tour there, which appeared recently in Exclusive. What does that mean? Uh, th there was a magazine called Exclusive, and um, I went on a, a trip, I went on several trips to Vietnam, and I wrote an article that was published in Exclusive, okay. and the president... Uh, I got another little goodie here. Federal Bureau of Investigation, 1966, Fulton Lewis, Mr. Lewis, wanted to express my personal thanks for your penetrating and hard-hitting broadcast last night. Sincerely, J. Edgar Hoover. I see, J. Edgar Hoover was one of these people. Remember I said I stumbled over people in the living room? Yes. He was a dear friend of my father's and, uh, and was over the house. Deke Deloche, who was a director of the, uh, uh, assistant director. Should oh. be rather familiar. Oh, yeah. One of the nicest. Oh, yeah. You, you said that, uh, who was it you were saying was such a great person? Uh, so uh, we, we were talking this about is, this is one of the I was talking earlier about falling over congressmen yeah. and vice presidents yeah. and things like that and my getting excited when I go to California okay. I had the opportunity not just to meet Jimmy Stewart but to actually work with him in the uh, production of a, of a TV documentary or, or oh, special so that's it so that's and it he narrated it. he narrated okay. it. what right. a person right. what a person. we don't have the video ladies and gentlemen but I'll tell you right now, here is the audio of Proudly They Came. Now, you're, you didn't produce the, 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 the production itself. No, the, the, this was in the early 70s. Uh, I believe it was 73. And the country was torn apart with demonstrations and protests and this and that. What and, else is new? Well, I know. And, and it, there was just a, a bipartisan, again, a bipartisan, by faith 
a group of people that got together and said, we just need to sit there. We can have our differences, but we've just got to remember that we're Americans. And so they took July 4th of that year to have a huge, and there were close to a million people there, mm -hmm. a huge celebration on the grounds of the uh, Washington Monument, and of course the Lincoln Memorial there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it was extremely impressive. In that program, and you mentioned this the other day because we just, we just lost Bob Hope. Bob Hope plays a <laughs> yeah. prominent role in this. Bob Jimmy Hope was the MC. The MC. Yeah. Jimmy Stewart did the introduction. Pat Boone sang mm -hmm. the Star Spangled Banner. Jack Jack, Benny. Remarks by Jack Benny and Dinah Shore. Jack Benny actually played the violin. Dr. Billy Graham. Jack Benny yeah. played the violin. Yeah. Well, we're going to find that video. And, I, I, I'll get it. I'll and we're going to see it in this yeah. area. And maybe, I don't know. I, I think, considering the state of affairs in the world today, and with thousands of us driving around with American flags mm -hmm. flapping on the backs of our cars and on doors and so forth, it's time for this program to run again. And we're going to do that. It, we're going to do it, that. It's a very, very, very impressive thing. And it was very appropriate then. It's very appropriate now. And you got, as well you should have, a nice letter from Mr. Robert I, Hope. Uh, what a person. I mean, yeah. honestly. You what spent a some time with him out there. We spent about three weeks. We had to get releases from all of these people. Yes. We've, we've got uh, Glenn Campbell on this thing singing The Impossible Dream. Well, oh. there was a little record company called Capitol Records that also had Glenn Campbell singing The Impossible Dream. Tell me that story. As, as, as long as we've got time. Well, I, I, think I went by Capitol there. Records and I said, I'm Fulton Lewis from Washington. They'd never heard of me and they barely <laughs> heard of Washington. <laughs> and uh, I go by, I said, I need you to sign this release. We're producing a record. They looked at it, and they laughed. And they, the guy, the lawyer came in and says, no way on earth, no way on earth that we're going to sign that. No way. So I go back to Bob Hope's office, and I go in, Mr. Hope, you know, I was out all day trying to get releases. I didn't get any. And I, every time, I, people laugh at me. And he said, hold on a second. So he picks up the phone. And he makes a phone call. He picks up another phone, makes another phone. He made about five or six phone calls. He and said, he all right, releases. tomorrow morning, you go by here, 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 here. And I walked in. It was Mr. Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> the man was king. I mean, he yeah. was just enormously respected. But I never thought we would get releases for this. He wasn't thing. beating people over the head, though. I mean, this was no. diplomacy. This no. was tact. And this, this, remember, uh, these record clubs would send out, you'd get the record, and mm -hmm. then if you didn't want it, you'd have to send it yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. Well, this became the Columbia Record Club's selection of the month for, it was the following uh, June. And, um, and uh, it, all the, all the pro this thing raised a lot of money, which all went to the Honor America Day Committee, which all went to scholarships, and uh, it, it, it was a neat event. It really uh, was. Dorothy L'Amour was here. The new Christy Minstrels. Red Skelton gave Red Skelton, the Pledge of Allegiance. That's right. That, his famous Pledge of Allegiance. Wow. That was the first time, probably, it was heard publicly. And the wonderful Bishop Fulton J. Sheen, yeah. who was... And Rabbi Tannenbaum was there and gave yeah. the invocation. Yeah. So it, it, was, it was just another one of these things. I, I, maybe I'm obsessed with this, but this idea of people coming together, Republicans, Democrats, mm -hmm. people of different mm -hmm. faiths, because we're all Americans, you know, there's plenty of room in this country for us to disagree. But well, we've got to remember that we're all Americans. Believe it or not, we have done a, a real number on the clock. We are, we are perilously close to being out of time. We I want to thank this, you, but I want to ask you. a two-hour show. <laughs> yeah, I want to ask you, Fulton, uh, you haven't been active in radio for, what, several? Oh, two decades. Two decades. Yeah. What do you do to keep busy today? I mean, you live in our area. You are a, a, a Sarasota, Bradenton type person. What do you do to, uh, to keep busy? Because we all look for things to keep I've, busy. I've got a, a small company that I started about 13 years ago, mm -hmm. which basically is a customer relations service I for see. car dealerships, boat dealerships, things like that. It's all done out of the home. We're, in, we're now in nine states. Um, wow. We don't have an office. Most of the people that work in this thing are like single mothers who've had a car accident and can't work, mm -hmm. and it really is kind of neat. Isn't and it's it's, nice? it's a win-win-win for everybody. Yeah, yeah. And then I boat. You I boat. love to boat. Yes. Every weekend, you will find me on my boat. I am here to testify that I have been on your boat, and to call it's it not a boat. A yacht. To call it a boat is a disservice. It's, oh. it's well on its way to yacht. Oh, it's 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 in that gray area. But I tell you it what, approaches forty feet. Keep it out at, uh, on, on Longbow Key moorings, which mm -hmm. is 
probably the nicest. Matter of fact, there was an article. There was an article the other day. That's right, you know, saying this is the finest marina the, the in the Morgan state of Florida. Morgan Steinmetz, I think it was. Morgan wrote it in the Sarasota Hale Tribune. And he said, this is, the, this is what a marina should look like. It, it, and it is, and it's run that way. Yeah. Well, listen, I, uh, I have run out of my little guide. I had numbers looking at me all for a while, and then he disappeared about a half an hour ago. I'm just going to go for it and say that we have run out of time. We can say that's the top of the news as it looks from here. Hey, thank hey. you for that. <laughs> thank you for that. Yeah, because that <coughs> is your dad's famous, way you famous signed off. line. Yep. Yeah. And I'm sorry I never, ever got to know the man, but I hope maybe our viewers have gotten to know Fulton Lewis Jr. a little better, and certainly Fulton Lewis III. Well, good luck on whatever, you know, keeps you, keeps you busy today. And uh, good health, and thanks so, so very much for Don, being I've with us. Don, I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you. My pleasure. Don Blair here. This was produced in the studios of METV in Bradenton, Florida, as all our shows are, and uh, as I said before, will continue to be. And this has been Broadcast Biographies from METV and the Broadcast Pioneers of Sarasota. Thanks much. See you again.